Elon Musk and Tesla. So uh, almost every single weekday, I like to look up the news for my companies, especially a lot of my big investments. So what I'll usually do is I'll type in whatever that company's name is, and then I'll go to news on Google. So I went ahead and did that today in regards to Tesla, just to see, you know, what's the big news in regards to Tesla, anything happening out there, right? Especially after a long weekend. And it's fascinating because I was looking and I was like, oh my gosh, like everything's negative. Like everything is negative almost. And and so I go ahead and I look here, right? Elon Musk confirms his threat. Give me 25% of Tesla or you don't get AI or robotics. Exclusive Tesla doing damage control discounts for European fleet buyers. Tesla price cuts hit rental companies hard. Tesla scrambles to repair reputation with rental companies after price cuts and poor service. One positive article, I guess we can say right here, Tesla releases FSD 12.4, new vision uh, attention monitoring. That's good. Then we got a neutral thing, not positive, not negative as far as the headline. Then back to the negative headlines, heart-stopping moment. Tesla owner nearly plows into moving train in self-drive mode. More negative, Tesla employees walking on eggshells as furious Musk continues layoffs. I slept in my car to work 12-hour shifts at Tesla, still got laid off. Tesla layoffs to continue through June, morale low among workers. Then we got a couple neutrals right here. Then we're back to the negative here, Bloomberg, three hours ago. Tesla shareholder group slams Elon Musk's $56 billion pay package. We got a positive one here out of Forbes. Use Tesla Model Y demand surges as prices drop. Then back to the negative. New Tesla might lose steam. Holy smokes, this ain't no joke. That was 10 negatives and two positives out of the headlines there, folks. 10 negatives, two positives, right? Meanwhile, I draw, every time I drive around Vegas, I see more and more Teslas on the road. I see more and more new plates for new Teslas out there, right? In my personal community I live in, where the homes are $2 million plus, guess what? I would say 30% of people that live in this community have a Tesla. If you can afford a $2 million plus house, you can afford probably any car. And the fact that these folks drive Teslas is fascinating. I drive Teslas. My neighbor right here has multiple Teslas. My neighbor on that side has Teslas. Across the street, they have Teslas. Every time I take a walk, Teslas, Teslas, Teslas. I would say at least 30% of the folks in my neighborhood have Teslas, right? Which is a good sign when people with money have Teslas, right? I go to the service center this past week. I had a couple like little things I'd been just kind of putting off that weren't major things that I needed to have done at the service center. Service center was buzzing, right? And not just in terms of service, but people actually actually ordering new cars as well. They have a sales team in there for Tesla as well, right? So we have all this going on, right? So what is the deal with Elon Musk? What's the deal with Tesla? We're going to discuss that. Is there any hope for this stock? Is this stock just dead money stock, right? And can we get to a point where these headlines start to flip to be a lot more positives than negatives, okay? So this is a Tesla dedicated video here today, a lot to go through. If you're a Tesla shareholder, you care anything about Tesla, I think today's video should help you out immensely. As somebody that's been through some roller coaster rides in regards to this stock over the years, whew, I mean, at the end of the day, you gotta always remember, Tesla's a whole lot of more fun than bad, right? I think that's always important to kind of keep in mind in regards to stock, but we've seen a lot of bad here recently. All I ask in return takes less than five seconds for you guys to do this. Hit a like on this video and make sure you're subscribed to your channel. That's all I ask for today's video. I've been prepping this for quite a while for you guys, okay? So where I want to start out this video here today is showing you a three-year chart of Tesla stock, right? It's been a rough past three years. The stock price is down over 16% in the past three years. Now, we know, obviously, the financials of Tesla have gotten a lot better over the past three years, but nonetheless, the stock price is still down quite significantly in the past three years. It gets much worse, though. If I pull up a 30-month chart of Tesla, ouch, 57% down in the past 30 months. It's not like that's really a short period of time, right? If if a stock's down a lot on a one-month chart or a three-month chart or even a six-month chart, even a 12-month chart, a lot of times you can kind of like, you know, whatever, it's just something going on in the short term. When it's a 30-month chart, and the stock price has been cut over in half, that's that's rough right now. Keep in mind, 
there was a lot of people that got into the stock at very bad pricing. And um, there was a little too much hype and excitement back at that particular time. Everybody was talking about Tesla 10 trillion. No one was talking about Tesla margins getting hit negatively, sales getting hit negatively. No one was talking about the Fed going up on interest rates or any of those sorts of things. It was just, everybody was just in this delusional phase of only positive in regards to Tesla, except for me, the guy who was, was positive about Tesla when everybody was negative on Tesla back in the day, right? And uh, I was warning people back then, hey, you know, we can have some things go wrong here. Sure enough, we obviously had a lot go wrong, right? Now, Elon Musk, this leads us to Elon Musk, right? A once beloved genius, beloved genius, the hope for the future. That was, if we go back to Elon Musk's brand many years ago, this was Elon Musk's brand. Even three years ago, five years ago, this was his brand. He was known as a, you know, this, this, like, almost like a, I don't want to say like a godlike figure, but somewhat of a godlike figure in regards to the business landscape. People loved Elon Musk. If they didn't love him, they really didn't have much of an opinion. There was like maybe 1% of people really like hated Elon Musk, but most either felt indifferent about him or they looked up to him like, like a legend, like, oh my gosh, he's a help for humanity. He gives us all hope, right? And things have, have changed. They've changed immensely, right? In regards to that. I mean, it was a perfect example. I, I, go on Google and I type in Elon Musk and, you know, usually it'll show somebody's Twitter profile and X now they call it, right? And what's his latest tweet or post or whatever we call it nowadays? Uh, Two hours ago, he posted this, right? The new woke times is truly unreadable and the racial bias built into photography. Now, you might agree with that. You might disagree with that. But one thing you can't disagree with in regards to this, right, is this is a very political based type statement, right? This is, uh, you know, clearly shots at a major news publication, right? The New York Times is extremely famous even outside of the United States, but especially in the United States. And, you know, going that sort of route, the new woke times is truly unreadable. This is the type of tonality in the way Elon Musk has been speaking the last couple of years, which isn't going to make you many friends out there. It's going to make you a lot, a lot of enemies, right? No, I told you guys it was a it was going to be a bad idea for him to buy X Twitter because it was going to hurt Tesla immensely, right? And I explained all that a couple of years ago, and sure enough, right? And, and you know he was at that time it was all about free speech and these sorts of things. But people that are against Elon Musk will push back and they'll say you aren't really free speech. They'll point out they, you know people that have been blocked that maybe have negative things to say about him and things like that, right? So. There's kind of like that contradiction of like, is it really free speech or is it not, right? You have Elon Musk obviously doing stuff like this. Like this is very common for him. Is like what I'm showing you, this isn't like some one-off like, whoa, Elon Musk, that's weird. He's posted that. Like, whoa, this is not at all. Like this is the norm. You're going to probably see several posts a week from Elon Musk saying stuff like this, doing, you know, stuff like this, right? Which you might agree with, you might disagree with. You might think that's funny. You might think that's disrespectful. You might think that's like, really, this is supposed to be one of the hopes for humanity, like trying to, you know, be a center of attention, right? And so this is where you get into the situation with Elon Musk, where it's like, do you want to be Trump? Do you want to be an influencer? Or do you want to be the CEO of the most important company in the world, right? Because many people view Tesla as one of the most important companies of the world for the next 10, 20, 30 years, or at least one of the, the, the most respected, most, you know, um, hope for the humanity type companies over the next many decades, right? And so this is the questions we have, right? And when you're constantly posting these memes and you're constantly saying stuff like this, people start to even, even people that might agree with you, even people that might be laughing, like I might have laughed at that, right? And even if you agree with this, right? Oh yeah, they are the new world times. Okay, you agree with that. Even then you start to ask yourself like, like, why are you not focused on Tesla? Why are you posting all this stuff all the time? These memes, these things that are taking shots at this. If you're really running one of the most important companies in the world, you need to be focused on that. Jensen, Jensen at NVIDIA is not out there, you know, tweeting memes and, uh, you know, all this other stuff, right? Tim Cook's not doing that at Apple. Sasha Nadella is not doing that at Microsoft. 
Zuck's not doing that. Like, these people aren't doing this sort of stuff. Well, maybe Zuck's doing a little bit now at this point in time. Maybe he's going Elon Musk around as well. I have seen him posting some more stuff. Not nearly to the level that, that Elon Musk does, but still, like, you look at the other guys and they're not really doing that. So that's a question, right? And that's a very negative question in general. If you have to even question if somebody's actually focused on their job of leading one of the most important companies in the world, that's already a problem, right? So that leads us to Tesla, right? Even after this crash, this is still a $548 billion company, right? Absolutely massive. Now, Elon Musk, he has obviously been, you know, pushing a lot of a certain type of agenda, right? And this has led him to essentially, if you, this was as of last year, I bet you the number's even better for him now in regards to this. But if you went back for, you know, 2021, how many people view Twitter as basically mostly bad for democracy? If it, for you know people that were Republican or lean Republican, sixty percent viewed Twitter, now known as X, as mostly bad for democracy. Right, incredible number. He's got that number as of last year all the way down to 21%. I bet it would be even better if we had a poll this year in terms of you know how many Republicans or lean Republicans view. Twitter acts as like, uh, you know, a mostly bad thing for democracy. So it, it has helped there. Now we're talking about 79 percentage points of no impact or mostly good from the Republican side or lean Republican side versus previous, it was 39%. So we're talking about a 40 percentage point jump there. Incredible, right? Now in terms of Democrats or folks that lean Democrat, they haven't gone that negative against Twitter. If you look here, we're up to about, there's, you know, about 35% of Dems or lean Dems view X as mostly bad, right? So about 65% say no impact or mostly good. So overall, he's actually, believe it or not, somehow helped the numbers in regards to X, in regards to how people view Twitter in regards to American democracy. It's gotten actually way less negative at this point in time, right? Now, so that's that whole situation. And the reason I bring up all that is because these are serious questions people ask, right? And the other reason I bring it up is maybe there's a method to his madness, right? You know, we didn't get this far by accident. Maybe, just maybe, there's a method to his madness. And all this will end up being a long-term help, even though it doesn't really look like a, a help right now. Maybe it is, right? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe there's something there, something to be considered, right? Remember, Tesla really never had Republicans, you know, attention before Elon Musk started to go a certain way, right? Now, I would say, I mean, I know a lot of Republicans that love Elon Musk now. And they, these folks never talked about Elon prior to like two years ago. And now they're reposting stuff. They love him. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe he's got something there. Maybe he's on something, right? No, this leads us to Cybertruck, right? Obviously, if you're going to be successful in the truck market, you better sell to Republicans too, right? Now, the threat has arrived in regards to Cybertruck. This baby, you're going to see it on the roads. I hope you guys see it on the roads. I'm already seeing them in Vegas. I've seen probably 10 to 20 Cybertrucks now out here in Vegas, right? Now, it's interesting, right? Because I, I was talking about Cybertruck recently, and there's some folks saying, oh, cyber truck this is no threat to trucks because i was making a point it was probably a week or two ago last time i spoke about tesla and i was making a point that gm is starting to take uh tesla very serious and they're trying to ramp up their electric vehicles uh in regards to the truck market specific right and uh, this is a major threat people don't even realize how big of a threat this is right and so let me take you back let me do a little history lesson for folks so model s comes out <clears throat> back in like 2012 right and so they ramp it in 2013 2014 and if you look back then, Tesla was delivering 22,000 vehicles a year, 31,000 vehicles a year. And you could have looked back then, you could have said, Model S, psh, Tesla's no threat to cars. They're no threat to cars. Give me a break. It's a joke, right? 2017, they were, uh, you know, rampant Model X at this particular time, right? And you could have said, psh, Model X, they're no threat to SUVs. Give me a break. It's a joke, right? And they sold a little over 100,000 vehicles in, in, in 2017 and told, right? But the fact was, Tesla was a big threat. People might not have viewed it as a threat. They might have laughed it off at that particular time. But Tesla was a massive threat. Guess what the best-selling passenger car was in the world last year? It was called a Tesla Model Y. Isn't that phenomenal? Outselling the unstoppable, unbeatable Toyota Corolla and dusting the Toyota RAV4, dusting 
the Ford F-Series pickup truck lineup that you thought couldn't be beat, outstripping a vehicle that you thought couldn't be outsold, the Honda CRV, you'd be flipping my flapjacks. And meanwhile, Model 3 sold a very impressive 200,000 plus units last year as well, right? Absolutely incredible for the 12th best selling passenger vehicle out there, right? Now, Model 3, by the way, saw it when I went, the, the new Model 3 in depth, when I went to the uh, service center this past week, whew, baby looks good. Looks really good. I used to have a Model 3 many, many years ago. I really liked the update they did, and I think that's going to be a huge breath of fresh air for Tesla overall. I think a lot of people are, are have forgotten about the Model 3 in terms of thinking about this for kind of being a game-changing product for Tesla's future. I look at Model 3 and I say, okay, Model 3, 200,000-something units sold, and I look at that Toyota Corolla at a million plus. I think that's where Model 3 is going long term. I think that's absolutely where Model 3 is going long term. I think the, sh the, the weakness in the short term is just the weakness in the short term. I think that will abate over time, right? This baby looks good. Really, really good in regards to that. Now, back to Cybertruck, right? This is just the start. The, the Cybertruck you see today is just the start. This is the vehicle to get a lot of attention, to get everybody talking, right? Which it has certainly done. I mean, the Cybertruck's probably the most famous vehicle in the world, and it literally just went into production, I mean, in the past, like, few months. That's incredible, right? But in regards to the, the pickup truck market, likely there's going to be a two-door, two-seat uh, truck coming down the road, right? A much cheaper price point, maybe a little more compact, maybe a little more built for work and not just for show. you got to keep in mind, you got a, a divided pickup truck market in general. It's important everybody understands this. you got the folks like my dad, who drives a pickup truck and has driven a pickup truck every day for the past 30 years, right? And he actually uses his pickup truck for work every single day. It's not just for show. So you have that segment of folks, right? Usually those people also, they don't drive new pickup trucks because they beat them up. They usually are the ones driving pickup trucks that are 10, 20, 30 years old, right? Then you have another segment of folks. These are the segment of folks that like to drive pickup trucks, they don't actually really use them for work. They use them for commuting. They use them to drive to the grocery store. They use them to drive the family around. And there's not much work getting done in that pickup truck. They use the bed maybe a few times a year. And that's about that. So you have a very divided pickup truck market. Now, the current cyber truck, this is phenomenal for the segment of people that buy pickup trucks, which is a large segment, who really just drive them because they like to drive pickup trucks. This is not a great vehicle, necessarily, for the, the work market. Do I see my dad driving a, a cyber truck to go, you know, clean pools and stuff like that? No. Do I see the landscaper using a, cy a cyber truck to go do landscaping? <laughs> no, okay? This is for the people that like to be cool and like to think, like, pickup trucks are cool. That's for that segment, okay, which is a huge segment. Tesla will likely have a, uh, another Cybertruck of some kind coming down in a couple years from now that will be more compact, smaller, much more affordable, probably even under a $40,000 price point, and will be very attractive for much more of the work folks out there, okay? That's important to understand that about the pickup truck market. Out here, on, you know, on the West Coast, there's a lot of people that drive pickup trucks. When I say the West Coast, I don't really mean California per se. I'm really talking about Arizona, even out here in Vegas. If you go to Texas, I mean, just, you know, whew, pickup trucks everywhere, 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 right? And so this is just a start. No different than if you look at the Model S and the Model X, those paved the way for the Model 3 and the Model Y. Those were just the start. You know, you could have easily said, oh, yeah, Tesla's no threat in cars. Tesla's no threat in SUVs. You were wrong. You were wrong, right? Maybe that particular one wasn't, but you were wrong about the long-term trajectory of what was actually happening with Tesla. These were just, these got a lot of attention. They got a lot of, I still remember going into a Tesla store. This was probably like 2011, 2011 and 2012. And I still remember seeing the skateboard. The, the bottom of the Model S in a Tesla store. I hardly knew anything about Tesla back then. And I was like, dang, this is cool. And I got educated very quickly about, whoa, this Tesla company, this is a pretty cool company. Like They're doing some interesting stuff. Like they, they Look at the battery pack on this thing, right? And then the Model X with the Falcon Wing doors. Like, how could you miss it? I mean, my gosh, just so epic. So these are the what paved the way for the future. No different than the Cybertrucks paving the way for future pickup trucks from Tesla, right? Now... We can get caught up into Elon Musk 
and what Elon Musk is doing with X and all the drama and what he says and all those sorts of things. Let me be very clear, that's not the reason why Tesla stock has been going through a tough time, right? If it is, it's maybe 5 or 10 out of the percentage points. The much bigger deal has been margins. Margins have been going down for the last couple of years, right? They peaked a couple of years ago and they've been basically going down. Now, my belief is, and I've shared this many times on the channel, that margins bottom for the company for in half of this year, right? So basically the period we're in right now, and then they start, start to increase and start to improve in the back half of this year, right? Which I don't see any reason why not. If I look, all the major price cuts are done now at this point in time. If anything, I think they could take some pricing here or there. And when I say take pricing, I'm talking about up pricing a little bit, right? It doesn't look like there's any major, major competitive, uh, like cost increases for Tesla. So they're also always finding ways to, to basically save money in the business. Obviously, we heard about all the job cuts, right? That's going to end up helping margins. So when I look at this overall, I think margins are going to start to increase. And then Cybertruck, right? The, the first half of the year, brutal, because I would almost imagine, I'd probably say they're losing money on every Cybertruck sold in the front half of the year. I think there's a decent probability they're still going to start making money on Cybertrucks in the back half of the year, because then they'll actually be scaled. They'll be ramped. And that's when you really start to see some nice margin and profitability come in for a vehicle once you're ramped, okay? So Cybertruck should start helping as well. So if I look at this overall... I think we're going to start to see margins increase back half of the year. I think we're in the, the, the troughing period of margins right now, and things will get a lot better as the year ticks on, and then get even much better in 2025 for margins, right? Now, this is, leads us to the entire auto market, right? And there's a couple of folks that speak about the auto market a, a lot, right? Lucky Lopez would be one, and this is another one I, I really enjoy, car, car questions answered, right? And he does a phenomenal job kind of breaking down what's going on in the actual auto market, kind of like boots on the ground, right? And it's fascinating because the auto market is not actually great right now. If you look at a lot of the auto manufacturers, their numbers have been okay, but you've got to understand the, the dealership model, right? If you're Ford, you're selling to the dealership, and so it takes a while for them to essentially stop you know, start re rejecting vehicles, right? There's kind of like a build-up ramp period back for the Fords, GMs, and all these big guys, right? And I think you're going to start to see as this year ticks on, the major auto manufacturers' numbers are going to start going down, down, down. It's going to start looking ugly for these guys. And, you know, you got folks like this gentleman that are out there breaking down, you know, what's actually going on, what's going on with the repos and, and those sorts of things. And it's fascinating because I've heard from two folks now that I would say are kind of like experts in the auto industry, that repos are going up significantly right now, right? And sometimes it's hard to find concrete data in regards to repos, so you got to really count on these folks that are actually boots on the ground, folks that are used car dealers, car dealers, you know, owners and stuff like that, to really talk about this. But from my opinion, uh, from what I understand, like, these repo companies are doing big business right now. I, from what I hear, they can't find enough people to go repo cars right now. Like that's one segment in the jobs market that is absolutely booming right now is the repo market. And the reason being is we had super easy credit, uh, credit conditions, right? You had a lot of these dealerships uh, basically giving loans to almost anybody as long as your credits, I mean, your credit didn't even have to be that decent, but they give you a loan. If you had the down payment, They'd give you the loan. And the down payment for some of these folks came from stimulus checks, came from PPP loans and things like that, right? Those days were long gone. And so now we're a lot of those vehicles that were sold back in 21, 2021, 2022, those payments are, have stopped being made either in 2023 or this year. And now those vehicles are now being repoed, which when all those vehicles start getting repoed, that, that causes problems in the auction market that can cause pricing to actually go much lower for used dealership it can cause a whole host of ramifications and problems that happen in the market then the dealerships start to be uh, you know question do they really need new inventory because look at the used inventory right and then do you drop pricing on used inventory because then if you drop pricing too much on used inventory then it's going to be harder to sell your new in inventory right which leads to a big problem there so you know, that's problems on problems on problems on problems in regards to this situation. And overall, I would not call the auto market healthy right now. I would not call it a good auto market right now. Not. No way. No way. And I'm telling you the big 
the big guys are going to start to feel the pain as this year ticks on, and the number is going to be more and more depressing as this year ticks on. You're going to see it from VW. You're going to see it from Nissan. You're going to see it from Ford, GM, all these guys. And then everybody's going to wake up and be like, ooh, auto market's not that good. And keep in mind, new car prices are still extremely high outside of Tesla. Tesla's one of the few that's really dropped pricing off a cliff. You look outside of Tesla, pricing's very high. And guess what? Interest rates are the highest we've had to deal with in, in 20 years or so. So that's basically everybody who's going to buy a vehicle. So that's not a good situation. And by the way, this repo situation reminds me of this video I saw a hundred years ago, pretty much. The mortgage meltdown, this was a whole segment 60 Minutes did. By the way, I think I'm melting down. That sun is hitting me hard right now. I think I'm ha I have a meltdown. Look at my skin. Woo, it's getting, it's starting to glow. So this is a great piece uh, 60 Minutes did back in the, the, the housing crisis, right? And there was this guy here and he ran this business essentially where the banks... Uh, you know, essentially would foreclose on a property the, the people that were living in that property got kicked out, right? And then there's a bunch of crap that's in the house that needs to be uh, exited the, the property, right? And so this man had a company essentially where he, he hired workers and they would go in and clear these houses out after the, the homes had been foreclosed on, right? And so um, he was talking in that vi video, I mean, his actual quote was businesses through the roof, right? He was talking about his business had 20 to 30 assignments a day, a day, he said, we, you know, this was in Miami, if I recall, Miami-Dade County. And he was talking about, like, you know, they're one of the few businesses that were actually hiring in 2008, 2009. Because they had so much business. I, man, that man probably retired, honestly. That, that man probably made so much money in that couple-year period. Uh, I mean, my gosh, because, you, you know, the banks, they're always flush with money. They're always willing to pay some, some good rates uh, to somebody out there. They don't know how much it is to actually clear out a house. I, I don't know. He must have made a fortune in that. But it reminds me a little bit of this repo situation we're starting to get into in regards to the car market. And keep in mind, that repo situation could get worse. We haven't really seen unemployment tick up in any significant way yet. If that were to happen, repos would kick up even much more considerable than they've already started to kick up with uh, actually low uh, and keep in mind, the other problem is if car values keep going down, right? Let's say car values go down, down, down. People start getting underwater on their cars and they start walking away. That's what happened in the great financial crisis. People forget why a lot of people lost homes. A lot of people didn't just lose homes because they lost their job or they couldn't afford the payment any anymore. I know people personally that walked away from their homes because, not because they lost their job, not because their income went away, not because they had a balloon payment and they couldn't afford it anymore, but because they went way underwater. And they paid $400,000 for a house, and then the house was valued at $200,000. And so they said, the hell with this? I'm done making these payments. Do a short sale, do a foreclosure, whatever. I'm out. I'm not going to keep paying on a $200,000 house now that I paid $400,000 for and has this insane mortgage versus what I could get. And so... There's a lot of those folks that happen, right? And so in the auto market, you, it might also, what we might go into over this next year is people walking away from their cars, not just because they say, you know what, I, I can't pay my bill anymore because I lost my job. It might be because people are saying, why am I paying this car down that I'm $7,000 underwater on, $10,000 underwater on, $15,000 underwater on? And guess what? People use their cars for trade-ins. That's a whole other problem. If you want to go buy a new car or a used car for that matter and use your vehicle as a trade-in, if you don't have it paid off in cash and you bought it in the last few years, you're probably underwater on that vehicle, which means then you're going to have to come out of pocket or then wrap that into a new loan, which is even a bigger payment, which you're probably not going to be able to afford because of interest rates. And then if you've got negative $4,000 equity in your vehicle and you wrap that in the new loan at a higher interest rate, you can't do it. You can't afford it. So that's problem on problem on problem on problem, okay? I hope you guys are, are staying with me in regards to all this, right? And kind of running you through what's actually going on in the reality of the auto market right now. You've got you to play chess with me for a moment and really run through this, right? Now, in regards to Tesla stock, the important thing to understand is I understand it's been so negative for really the last year or two. So negative. And it seems so drama-filled and so, my, ugh, 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 that you might think this is new. But I'm just here to tell you, as somebody that's watched the stock for a long time, and somebody that's been a shareholder for many years, this is not new, okay? Right here back in this period, a lot of people thought Tesla was going to go bankrupt. There was, here's what people were saying back then. There's only, what, one company ever in, in the U.S. auto sector that didn't go bankrupt, and that was Ford, so they were saying, you know, Tesla's going to go bankrupt back here, right? Then right here, after the stock went up a bunch, people said, this is insane, 
This is ridiculous. They're never going to be a mass market vehicle maker. The fact that it's trading at this valuation is silly. It's trading at valuations like some of the big auto manufacturers are, and they're never even going to be a mass market car. They'll always be a niche company like a Porsche or something like that, right? They were saying that back then. Then right here, another big uptick for the stock. People are saying it's a bubble stock. This is, you know, clown territory. Insane, right? Then we had the funding secured situation with the SEC, and there's a lot of there was a belief that maybe Elon Musk would have to, would have to step down as CEO of Tesla overall because of that funding secured tweet he had sent, right? So Elon and tweeting, man, it's been a problem for a long time. Okay, this is nothing new. Then right here, back in kind of mid 2019s, people started talking about maybe Tesla could go bankrupt again. They had some insane losses. There was a much slower growth rates at that particular time. It was looking bleak. And then, woo, did we have a lot of fun. Tesla's revenues went to the moon. Massive hype cycle in regards to stock. You know, then the bubble talk started again, right? Elon ends up buying Twitter. That was obviously, you know, a problem there. It got a lot more enemies and friends. And then now we're kind of in this period where people think Tesla can't grow again. They can't get their margins right again, these sorts of things. So, you know, the negativity, these, you know, existential crises for the company. This is nothing new, folks. This has been going on. This continues to go on, right? So me, as a Tesla shareholder, I look out there and what do I see? I see a company that's long-term trend is intact. Their revenue is heading the right way. Look at the last 10 years for their revenue. Look at the last one year of their revenue, you're gonna get depressed. Look at the last 10 years of your revenue, you're gonna say this is one of the greatest companies in the world, right? I'm a much bigger believer in 10-year trends versus one-year trends. Look at Tesla's net income over the past decade. Absolutely incredible, right? Look at Tesla's margins over the past decade. Incredible. EV wave, it has its ups and downs, but at the end of the day, we're, this isn't going backwards. We're going EVs. Hey, people can try to stop it. They can try to say, oh, this, that. We're going EVs, okay? There's no, there's no option there. We're going EVs. And who's the big player in EVs is Tesla. Is there anybody that's looking like they're ready to unseat them? No, there's not. Not, not in the United States, not in Europe, maybe in China. It's a different situation, right? There's a lot of competition in China, but not in the U.S., not in Europe. If you talk about robo-taxi opportunity, Tesla's clearly in the lead there, in my personal opinion, in terms of real, real-world AI driving vehicles. So when I look at all this across the board, I say, yeah, it's, it's a very negative time in regards to Tesla. It's been a negative time, but that's not going to last, right? And so as a, somebody has been holding this stock for many years, I don't see any reason to get out of it. And I think, I mean, the great news is when you're, everything is so negative, like it is right now, it seems like there's only other one other way. And it's things to go more positive, right? In regards to the commentary, articles, those sorts of things. I mean, we're, we're pretty much max level negativity in regards to this. What are we gonna get to 12 negative articles and zero positive, maybe? But that is what that is. Long-term companies are valued based upon revenue, net income, and growth rates, okay? And so that's, that's my two cents in regards to that. Before you guys leave today, the pinned comment down there, 1000xstocks.com. This is our service we've been creating for quite some time behind the scenes. I want to show you around a, a minute here. So, because I know a lot of you guys ask me about 1000X, like what, what's going on here and whatnot. So basically, 1000X is a great research tool for long-term investors. A lot of other products out there that are generated are really made for traders in the market, really stock charts and those sorts of things, technicals. This is a product that is made for people like me, long-term investors. That's what I wanted to create with this, right? And so I can type in a ticker symbol, right? And then pull up all the metrics that are important to me forward. P, trailing 12 month, P, peg ratio, and all is given to me in seconds right? In regards to a company overall. And we're adding a lot more metrics. We're actually working on, I think it's 14 new metrics right now um, behind the scenes. So we should have probably in the next, I would say week, we're going to have another like 14 metrics here to judge companies on. And then we also have earnings calls on here as well. So you can type in, you know, I don't know, we want to hear NVIDIA's conference call, type in NVDA. We can get NVIDIA's conference calls to all pop up here. So NVIDIA, Boom, boom, and boom. There's NVIDIA's conference calls. We want to listen to Palantir's conference calls. Boom, Palantir. Let's go ahead and pop up that guy. Boom, Palantir's conference calls. And you can adjust the speed you want these conference calls played at as well. So let's say I want 
the call played at 2x speed or 1.5x or 1.25x. I can do all that right there. We have our metrics tab right here, which is phenomenal. By the way, in regards to conference calls, we're actually looking right now to add transcripts. So that's the next wave that we're trying to do in regards to earnings call is add transcripts as well. We have all our stock market terminology to explain all these different metrics we have here. And we'll have the new, you know, like 14 different metrics that we're gonna have. We'll have that explained as well. And then my favorite feature is right here, compare. And this is where you can compare three stocks all against each other. So you can see where all these metrics are trading at versus each other. You can see exactly where stocks usually trade at roughly versus where these stocks are at versus, you know, so let's say I wanted to, um, you know, do Microsoft here. So I do Microsoft and let's say I want to do Apple right here, APL, boom. So now I can go ahead and compare those three versus each other, right? So pretty darn cool. And I'm like, you know what? I want to compare meta versus those. So boom, go ahead, meta. Compare and boom. I mean, you know, that, that stuff that if I want to compare all these metrics using other websites, it's take me 30 minutes, 45 minutes to do all that. And I just did it in seconds. That's that's a phenomenal thing. So if you're looking to apply to join 1000xstocks.com, go to 1000xstocks.com. And on the front page there, you'll be able to apply. And uh, maybe we'll be able to get you in there in the next you know week or two. All right, guys, much love as always. Appreciate you joining me and have a great day.